Let's get now to our interview with one of the major players and really parties to this dispute. Steve Lott joins us now, Executive Vice Chairman, Canadian Natural Resources. Steve, it's great to see you. Finally, we've been trying to get you on BNN Bloomberg for years. Uh, Canadian Natural, you're a company, you have a distinctive style, you, you, you've avoided coming on. Um, you like to, in some ways, keep things you know, to yourselves, uh, just get about your business. Huge returns for shareholders over the years. Why did you feel it was important, though, to come on BNN Bloomberg and speak to this issue, the need, as you see it, to cut Alberta production? You know, uh, Andrew, I think this is a super important issue for Alberta and for Canada and for Alberta citizens. Uh, the market, as we see it today, is broken and dysfunctional. Uh, so there's a role for the government to play to bring order back to the market. And uh, this is costing $100 million a day for Canadians that could be used to build hospitals, help schools, build roads. That money, all that wealth has been transferred outside of Canada. And at Canadian Natural, we uh, support uh, Rachel Notley and what she's done, as well as Jason Kenney coming out yesterday saying that action needs to be taken. So mm -hmm. we support the fact that there's been a panel set up and that they're looking to take action here in short order to correct what we see as a very dysfunctional market and allows just a few players to exploit uh, basically Albertans and Canadians and transfer $100 million a day uh, basically to the U.S. Um, what would you say to Suncor, Steve Williams or Imperial's Rich Kruger? Both of them have indicated, nope, we're, we are not interested in seeing a cut. Uh, for example, Rich Kruger said, you know, people have to live with the investment decisions they made over the years. What would you say to them? I think he's right. They shouldn't really live with the investment decisions they make. In a normal free market, uh, that would work. Uh, the market is not uh, functional right now. It's dysfunctional. Uh, I don't think anybody in the industry, uh, including Imperial or uh, the government for that matter, realized uh, the dysfunction that was in the market as we neared capacity or takeaway capacity uh, was reached. But the dysfunction in the market and the system is broken. Uh, when you have this kind of dysfunction and uh, a broken market, there is a role for the government to uh, step in and bring order to the market. It makes no sense for us to sell our oil for 30% of what you could sell it for in the U.S. on a global market or 45% for what you'd sell for light oil. So I think if you had Canada selling cars they made in Can Ontario for 30 to 45% mm -hmm. of what it costs to make them in the uh, U.S., there'd be an outcry as well. So it's, it's a dysfunctional market and it's something that can be fixed and we are very uh, confident that the Alberta government uh, will take the appropriate action. You've noted that under previous governments, Peter Lougheed, for example, um, the, the government did for a long time a mandate every so often cuts in production when pipeline space ran short. It just makes sense. Uh, you should only produce what you can actually take away. And it's the Alberta's resources, they own the resources, and so uh, they should be the ones to decide whether it gets produced or not. It's a very simple solution to, uh, to get this. I think a temporary curtailment would fix the, uh, the problem very quickly. The secondly, you need to have the nomination or apportionment rules uh, modified and be enforceable because uh, that is partly the, the cause of what's a dysfunctional market. The rules have lots of gaps in it and allow certain players to exploit those rules and extract value from Alberta producers and Alberta citizens and Canadian citizens. Now apportionment is obviously the allocation of uh, pipeline space or connected to that. What do you mean by some players are gaining an advantage here? Well the way the system works now, and it worked fine when you had enough takeaway capacity, uh, I'll give you an example. There's, there's a number of examples where you can basically game the system. So if you have storage barrels and you have a tank of storage and it doesn't even have to have oil in it, you're allowed to nominate that oil or your capacity, your tank, whether you have oil in it or not, onto the Ambridge mainline. Uh, these are what essentially are called air barrels, so you have a bunch of barrels that don't actually exist get nominated onto the system. Then Enbridge has to basically roll everybody back or portion everybody back uh, to meet capacity. So a bunch of those air barrels get nominated back. So if you're a storage owner, uh, you've nominated a bunch of air barrels, you get half of those barrels back or 45% of those air barrels back, you're then allowed to ship what barrels you get, the sort of like 55% of what you nominated. 
they probably don't have those barrels or they can keep those barrels in storage and buy those barrels from producers on the post, post apportionment market oh. at steep discounts. And so what you see happen here and has happened over time is as more and more of the, these players uh, figure out how to play the game, you've actually seen the differential blow out, particularly on light oil, to very high levels, basically to the basically the shut in economics. So that's how much they've driven it because producers who don't have storage either have to shut in or sell into a discounted market. And it allows, the way the rules are set up, that's just one example, mm -hmm. it allows individuals basically to game the system and capture windfall profits. That's interesting. We've only heard kind of inklings of that. Who's doing this though? Is it producers, uh, specialist storage companies? It's a variety of people. Though the people that, you know, it's, I'm just talking about storage, the refiners, there's people with pipeline space, people with rail space. Uh, everyone can play this game to, to a certain degree. Uh, the real losers are Canadian citizens and mm -hmm. Alberta citizens who are the ones that are getting paid royalties on the price. Of course, when the price is very low, royalty income goes down. And that's when we talk about this $100 million of wealth transfer that's going on mm -hmm. that doesn't pay royalties and doesn't pay taxes here in Canada. And that hurts how we build hospitals, how we fund hospitals, schools, roads, all those things that governments are supposed to be doing. So. This is a massive wealth transfer uh, because of a distorted market that's broken. And I think there's a very clear role here for the government to come in and bring order to the market and uh, do that very quickly. If we look at your production breakdown, obviously heavy oil is a big part of the mix. You're so diversified, you're huge. I mean, a million barrels of, of oil a day, but heavy oil up there by your calculation about a quarter. I mean, I have to put the question to you, should you have seen this coming at Canadian Natural? Was it a strategic failure on the company's part not to ensure that it had this natural hedge in terms of refining assets? I can always look in hindsight and look at everything. I don't think it was a strategic error. If you look at uh, where we are, line three will be coming on here uh, probably this time next year. That will basically alleviate this problem. So this is a problem that is short term and I think that's why we talk about temporary curtailments. Uh, this can happen uh, very quickly and actually I don't think you'd see these wide differentials if the system was working normally. And I'll give you an example. If you look at apportionment in July, it was 45% and the differentials were about $25 for heavy oil. Mm -hmm. Today, in December, apportionment is 45% and the differential is $45. The same physical dynamics are going on. The only difference is uh, the players, the intermediate players have figured out how to play the game and everyone is nominating even more and uh, playing the game to widen the differential. Um, I know this is a complex, you run, I mean, a complex business, international business, but can you give us any kind of a handle on, say, a change in the discount of about $5, say, on Western Canadian Select? What would that mean to your cash flow per share? Can you give us any kind of a handle on that? So for every dollar uh, change in Western Canadian Select price, that's about $91 million of cash flow for us. Okay, and what would your total cash flow be roughly this year, do you? Our cash flow is going to be in that uh, 9.7 to 10.2 billion dollar range. I mean, we should remember you're a cash flow machine. It's obviously um, um, frustrating for you right now, but you're still generating massive cash flow uh, for investors. You have stepped up. You're cutting production by around 50,000 barrels a day, uh, something like 5% of your production, particularly in heavy oil. Will you have to cut jobs, do you think? Our goal is not to cut jobs. So we've gone through this whole downturn and have not laid anyone off. And we don't expect to lay anyone off uh, going through this. I will say this though, uh, we've laid down drilling rigs. Uh, we're not recompleting wells. We're not working over wells that go down. Uh, so service rigs are not working. And when they're not working, those are a lot of service jobs that are not uh, getting done. So there's people that are not working because of that outside of the company. What about the dividend? I mean, could you see this situation? I know you, you're, you're, you, you reckon it's going to be temporary, but could the dividend ever be at risk? Would you, would you go there, cut it? No, I don't think you'll see the dividend at risk at all. We always plan for this, uh, the dividend to be robust through any part of the cycle, mm -hmm. and uh, we're very confident dividend will be there. Now, we're going to get very shortly Mr. Morneau, the federal finance minister, providing his fiscal update. What, would you, what do you want to hear from him, from the federal government? I think what we need to hear, and I think you're hearing this from all businesses across Canada, 
is Canada needs to be more competitive. You're seeing massive outflows of capital from Canada to the U.S. and you're actually seeing uh, capital from the world globally uh, leave Canada and go elsewhere. U.S. is our biggest competitor and our biggest supplier of capital and we're just not competitive. Our tax rates are too high. Uh, you'll be able to discount or use uh, your capital spending in the year you spend it against your taxes in the U.S. In Canada you cannot do that. So that basically disincents uh, capital spending and all the jobs that get created with that are disincented. So we need to have a more competitive environment here in Canada so that we can compete for capital with the U.S. Would you see yourself, I mean, Steve Williams of Suncor, as you know, has warned, I'm not making new investments in this country until this pipeline egress problem is settled. W would you yourself consider making a big investment in the States, for example, rather than Canada? Uh, we're not in the U.S. right now. We don't see going there. So uh, we're basically in Canada, the U.K., and offshore West Africa. I will say that we're doing our budget right now. And uh, clearly, uh, the U.K. and offshore Africa look much better than Canada for investments. We're still working it out, but they look much better. Steve, thank you very much for joining us. Obviously, a, a kind of a somber time for the Western Canadian industry. But we hope you'll come back before too long.